You have an outline. I don't know whether or not we'll complete it or not. But I think I can share with you in the next minute or two the whole of what I have to share with you this evening. And the rest of it will be details. The burden on my heart, things have been going through my own mind for a couple months off and on, something that I've been enjoying for myself is that in our Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest, it is impossible, impossible to separate his power from his love. The two are inextricably linked. They're tightly bound together and you can't tear them apart. Here's what I mean, and why it's important, why that kind of a thing is more than just a set of words. Um, I'll give you several examples, but first of all, how many of you have ever been in a, a car as the driver with a passenger beside you or behind you that was sort of a hint driver? Kind of, I wonder what the speed limit is along this road. Or, oh, I wonder if they just put that stop sign in. Or you've, you've got a hint helper along the side. Have you ever been a hint helper for the Lord in your life? Kind of a gentle suggestion that he may want to focus a little bit of attention over on this particular area that's a little bit of a concern and seems to be neglected. That's when we don't have a, a sense of his power in our hearts you know we would never sit in the passenger well very rarely would we sit in the passenger seat and reach over and grab the steering wheel and try to drive unless you're a driver's ed instructor or something like that so you might kind of subtly reach over and <clears throat> give a little hint and that's how i think most of us act with the lord but i want to encourage turn our focus and our attention on the lord tonight and see why his power and his love cannot be separated. Let me give you one more example of one of these two things. I'm going to be as deliberately vague as possible. Uh, but someone that has sat in these seats since this camp was held in this facility, in this building, in this room that I'm standing in. I've had a conversation with them this year, and that conversation with them this year involved them expressing to me what I'll characterize as having lost a sense that God had power. There had been a situation in their life, and in that situation, they did all the right things. They checked all the right boxes. They went to the right people for advice. They went to... Uh, you're supposed to read your Bible, they read their Bible. You're supposed to pray, they prayed. And they weren't getting deliverance in their circumstances. And as they expressed it to me, they felt betrayed by the Lord. They went to him for his power. And as they saw it, he didn't give it to them. So they came to the point where they doubted his love. And now as of the conversation I had with them, that person is, I would call it, teetering on the drink, brink of agnosticism. Is there a God? Well, I don't know. They're not quite there yet, but they're awfully close. Because they lost a sense in their heart that this person, the Lord Jesus Christ, had power and love for them that was in perfect union. It couldn't be divided. I'm going to give you a figure of it. It's in the Old Testament. We won't spend a whole lot of time on the figure. But the high priest had his garments of glory and beauty. And there's a lot to them. It's a beautiful subject. I'm not going to take it up with you. There's just one part of it that I want to, one little dinky piece of the whole. You can study the whole thing and it's beautiful. But that high priest had on his heart. It says on his heart, not just on his chest. The scriptures use the word heart. It was on his heart, it was a breastplate, and it had in it those stones. 
and they're connected to shoulder plates. And so just to get a little bit better figure of it, this is obviously not a very detailed rendition, but it gives the part I'd like to focus on this evening. It had the 12 stones, and this picture doesn't show it, but the names of each of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on them. They were engraved on them. They were carved in stone. You know, you grab a little gel pen like the one in my pocket, and you scribble a note, and you set it down in the wrong spot, and if you do it too quickly, it'll just smudge and smear the ink on something else. You engrave a name on a stone, it's not going to get rubbed off. Those names were engraved on the breastplate, on the heart of the Lord Jesus. He's the figure of that great high priest. And then on the shoulder pads, those same six names, but six on each side, were engraved in onyx stones and set in pouches of gold. The shoulders represent power. And so in that power, the, the government shall be on his shoulder, it says in Isaiah. You have the shepherd in Luke 15 carrying on his shoulders, plural, the sheep. It's a place of power. If you want to push a vehicle, you may, or push something, you may get down and put your shoulder into it. It's a place of power. The heart, the place of love. This is what I want you to notice. We'll turn to the scripture to give the figure of it in um, Exodus chapter 28. In Exodus 28 and verse 22, just read fairly quickly down through, and then I'll back up and just give you a couple um, key words. Verse 22. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the ends of wreath and work of pure gold. So stop right there. Those chains that connect the shoulder plates and the breastplate and the figure I have there aren't, well, I'm very glad for whoever created the graphic, but they're not precise to what we just read. So let me give you what we just read. Apparently, those chains, gold's fairly soft. And so if you have pure gold, it's relatively soft. It's easy to work for a metal, it's soft. And if you want to make it so that it's very strong, you know, those steel cables, like you'll have a suspension bridge, and those steel cables will suspend that bridge. You, if you look in closely, you got a lot of fibers that are twisted together, and then those cables themselves are woven together in some way. And I understand in the original, I'm not a scholar, I read it in someone else's who is, so from, I got it from someone else who is, and in that verse 22, at the ends means that twisted. Had the word has the idea of twisted in it. So it's like the fibers, the thin strands of gold were twisted together to make ropes. And then those ropes were woven together to give a cable like those steel suspension cables that hold up a giant bridge that you run semi-traffic across. That's the connection between the shoulders and the heart. It's not coming undone, and it's made of gold, a symbol of divine righteousness. God cannot act in power toward you without a heart of love in the motive and in the work that he's working out in you. And he can't have a heart of love toward you or to me or toward anyone else without the power to carry out what he needs to carry out, what he has planned in his counsels. The two go absolutely together. But in our life, we're hint drivers in the life that God has us leading. And we're hint drivers because we lose sight of him. We lose sight of his heart. We lose sight of his ability to do something. And I want to take a couple minutes to run through an analogy. This is just an analogy. You could pick it apart. This is not the truth. But I want to give you an analogy, just as the Lord said to uh, the Pharisees, I guess, that they could discern the face of the sky. I want to show you that you have a certain kind of discernment that makes you ready, should be, if there's faith, to accept the fact that God is fully able to work in our lives. So this is the analogy. Suppose you lived in a dot-verse. 
This is a dot verse. And we have our nice green person narrator off on the upper right who's narrating on behalf of the green dot. But the dot verse consists of one dimension, this line that's horizontal, and has two separate red dots, one on either side. And imagine you're this person in the dot verse. Now you live beyond the dot verse so you can think for the person in the dot verse, you're past that one dimension. You're looking at this one dimension and suppose you're a very intelligent green dot person. And you go back and forth and you investigate in your world and you head over and you find on the right, there's a red dot to the right. And you discover more searching past that red dot on the right. There's nothing past there. You go back in the other direction. You come to another red dot. Over off on the left, beyond that, there's nothing else. And you investigate carefully. And you're quite confident. It's my analogy for us as we walk about our daily life, as we examine things, as we think about them, without reference to God, and form our own conclusions. But along comes somebody. And that person comes along and they join a dot verse with us. This is a blue person off on the left. I've got the little narrator up on the left. And the blue person comes along and says to the green dot person in their dot verse, you know, those two red dots, they're actually part of the same thing. Well, that's ridiculous. Couldn't possibly be part of the same thing. I walk over to the right and I come across one of them. I walk over to the left, I come across the other one of them. They're distinct, they're different, they're not the same. Now you outside the dot verse of one dimension, tell me how they could be part of the same thing. Thank you, Adrian. Could be a circle. Is it a circle? Could be, he said. He has knowledge beyond this dot verse, and he suggests a circle. Okay. Why aren't you confident, Adrian? Can't see the rest. Anything else it could be? Did I hear square? Okay, I did. Um, my hearing isn't completely gone yet. Yeah, it could be a square, right? You could have a square that could connect those. Anything else? There's an infinite number of answers. You could have a weird squiggly drawing of just about any shape that could connect those two dots if you could see beyond the dot verse. You don't know what's beyond it. Here's my point. You don't know what's beyond it unless I tell you. There are a tremendous number of people on this earth tonight who are ready to tell God what his world is like. He's far beyond us, the one who breathed in there with the stars, the one who spoke, and it was, and who has spoken and given to you something that just about every one of you holds tonight, his word. And his word is the perfect revelation of what is beyond what your experience will give to you. And yet how many of us have recourse not to his word, I'm not talking in our speech with one another in a room like this. I'm talking about in the reaction of the heart when you are um, held up at work for an extra 15 minutes and you have to work extra because the computer crashed and you have to reboot it. I'm talking about the little things of life that are fully in the control of one who has power and love. This particular case, I did draw a circle. There was a circle outside, but my point is, it could have been anything. The only way to know is to be told. The only way to know is to be shown in this book what the heart of the Lord is. And so I would like to walk through with you three examples in the word that show the great high priest combining his power and his love and action. And we'll pick up details as we go along. So the first of them is in Mark's Gospel, chapter um, 5. And we'll follow the thread in Mark, but I will mention um, some details. 
from other Gospels. So we have the full story. It's beautiful. I would suggest, I would strongly encourage you to uh, take and put in parallel the different stories in the different Gospels, not to try to blend them all together to get one chronological account, but to see the beauty of each one. You get the whole picture. You see the beauty of why the Lord brought out different details in the different Gospels. And uh, you can gain from it in that way. But let's just read a few of the verses here in Mark, beginning with verse 24. And Jesus went with him, that is, with Jairus, who had come to him. And much people followed him and thronged him. A certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind. And then pause there. Here's this woman. And let's set the scene, including details from some of the other Gospels, before we go on, just to see what it really must have been like for her. And I also want to show you a little bit, perhaps, if there's time, how God can take a very complex situation and deal with all kinds of things at the same time. But first of all, here's this woman, and she comes along, and there's a big crowd, right? This woman had an issue of blood. Does anyone remember what that made her? In Israel. Made her unclean. You can look it up in Numbers 15. Numbers 15, there's, I don't know, 5 to 10 verses. It's Numbers, uh, I'm sorry, Leviticus 15, verses 19 to 27. And it goes through her being unclean. And her uncleanness would have cut her off from Israel if she had made it known. I don't know whether she hid it or she didn't, but I do know this. In Matthew, it says, she said in her heart. So I would suggest to you that she might have been hiding, but I'm confident she was cut off from others because of this issue. There was a barrier there, and you may be sitting in your seat, and you're physically present with others. Maybe there have been physical barriers earlier in this year. Now you're physically present with others, but in your heart, you're cut off. Because there's something there that you don't want there. And it destroys that fellowship with others. And this isn't a situation she was casual about. She'd gone to the doctors and tried a couple and then figured she wouldn't worry about it. Uh uh. She spent how much? I don't know the amount of money, but how much relative to her resources? It was all that she had. Spent everything. This was a big deal. She's cut off in Israel from relationship, and I would suggest from Matthew in her heart, she's cut off because she has the counsels in her heart. She doesn't go take counsel with her friends. She's cut off. And you may feel cut off by your problem from something that's good. And you've gone to everybody looking for a solution. You know, it's fascinating. If you go through it in Luke's account of this, there are, I think, four at least, maybe five uh, statements that are exclusive to Luke that don't appear in what we read in Mark. And they all have to do with people. He's dealing with man and the heart. And you know, Luke was a doctor, right? So Dr. Luke says, he admits the doctors couldn't help. And he says, she couldn't be helped by anyone. She couldn't be helped by anyone. You may be sitting here tonight and you may feel like 12 years is a really long time. And I've asked the Lord, and I've asked the Lord, and I'm last Lord. In this case, she went to the physicians. The next person had come to the Lord. Looking for an answer. And it's not there. So the heart of love of God can't be there. That's not true. It sure seems like it. Because in my experience. That's what I'm living. 
And you can't tell me what I'm living. No, I can. But God knows exactly what's going on in your heart. And he has a purpose and love for you and for everybody around you. And so this woman comes. And she comes behind. And in the account, she says, I'll just touch his clothes. But you've sung the Sunday school hymn. When he gets, she gets there, she doesn't just touch his clothes. She touches what? Probably singing it in your head. And you just don't want to. Yell it out with a mask on. She only touched the hem of his garment. You know what was on the border of a godly Jew's garment? There was a reminder of the law. There were some tassels on the corners of that garment. They were woven in with blue. And there was a reminder there of the law. In fact, Jews today, in their prayer shawl, the more orthodox ones, they have, I think it's 613 knots. Because the way the rabbis have divvied up the Old Testament law, they have 613 commandments and regulations and so on. And so they have 613 knots. So that when they look down, they're reminded of the law. You know, that woman came behind the Lord, hiding in a big crowd in a throng, but she came to the right person. And when she came to him, she reached down to what would have condemned her. The reminder of what would have condemned her, the law. But met in the person of Christ. She was instantly healed. Instantly healed. You say, well, I, I've checked the boxes. I've prayed. I've done this. I've done that. I've done the other. And I haven't been instantly healed. I want you to watch what comes next. It's really part of the whole process. She touched the border of his garment. And... Um, Sorry, I've lost the verse here. I'll have it back in a second. Um, it says, she had grown worse, came in the press behind and touched his garment. Verse 28, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. She's touched his power. She has healing. Scriptures don't say specifically, but from her actions, I have no doubt that she wanted to escape out of that crowd and go home healed. She wanted to exit stage left and go back around the corner and vanish the way she had come. Why didn't the Lord let her do that? Maybe she was a private person. Maybe she wanted to hide. But look what the Lord does. And if you bring in the account in Luke, you get the full picture of what was happening here. And it's, again, it's beautiful, the details Luke has. They have the, the personal side, uh, the people side. But I'll read it here first in Mark. And Jesus, verse 30, immediately knowing in himself the virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Remember, it's a big crowd. Now here in Mark... It says, um, the disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me. But bringing in a couple details from Luke, it turns out that before the disciples spoke up, the crowd said, wasn't me. Wasn't me. Wasn't me. Remember, there's a great throng, and they all denied it. It didn't happen in 1.3 seconds. And here's that woman trying to hide. What's she hiding from? She'd experienced his power, but she didn't know his heart. And God will not let you have his power without his heart. He wants you to have both. And so he calls her out. And oh, why is he putting me through this uncomfortable circumstance? I don't like it. Because when he's done, you'll have so much more of him than you'd have if you could sneak out with a chunk of his power without his heart so the disciples get a little uncomfortable and that's when they speak up here the, the big crowd remember the disciples had already been out and about they're connected with the lord and it's embarrassing there's this big crowd 
How could it be that he's asking this question? It's embarrassing. And so they reprove him. Verse 32. And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. Go straight to that woman. And she knew. I don't think it's here. I'm sorry, I don't have the retentive memory to tell you which Gospels, but I have, if anyone wishes it, I have all kinds of notes that you're not going to get that you don't have in the outline. I'm happy to just copy-paste into an email. They won't be beautifully formatted or anything, but if you want to spend more time on the subject, I'm happy to send them to you. And you'll get a lot of the details from the other Gospels there. But I believe he looks at that woman, and in another one of the Gospels, it says she knew she couldn't be hid. She knew there was no other way. And so she comes, but the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in, in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Now it's all out in the open. There's a big crowd there, and there's the disciples there, and there's the Lord there, and it's all out where it can be seen. Now what does she hear? In Luke, and I think in Matthew, he says, be of good courage. Here in Mark, we have the rest of it. Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. What does she get? She gets encouragement. Be of good courage. She gets relationship. She hadn't had it for 12 years. In the sense that she was unclean. And if she hid it, she had a rotten relationship because he was a hide, she was hiding a lie. And if she didn't hide it, she was unclean from all those around her. And now in the presence of everybody, whether they knew or didn't know, they knew now she had a relationship. The Son of God. But the Lord Jesus, he calls her daughter. It's a beautiful thing to know our relationship with him. The Lord will not use his power in your life. I'm not trying to speak in a way that is limiting him in the sequence of time that he uses with you. But I mean, in the totality of his purposes with you, he's not going to give you his power without giving you his heart, as he does with this woman. It's bound up as a high priest in that full figure of who he is and what he is for you. And so he says here to her daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. She reached out and touched him with faith. She knew that the issue of blood was dried up. She knew it wouldn't come back. He says, go in peace and be whole of thy plague. He didn't put her through pain because... He wanted to see her suffer for something that she'd been hiding. She had to come to the light so that she could know his heart, and then everybody would know this woman is clean, and this woman belongs to me. It's a beautiful thing. God will not deal with us in our lives, except he's doing it for our good. And again, if I go back to that analogy, we may not see it. We may not be able to sense What's going on outside of our view? But her faith, it says by faith, she'd come and touched the right person. She came to the right person. She didn't know much when she came, but she came to the right person. And she leaves with assurance, with encouragement, with relationship, and with uh, the, assur the assurance that her plague was truly gone, not just temporarily stopped. Let's turn over to the second one. That was personal need. I'm going to turn to the next one that has to do with a loved one. Again, we'll trace it in Mark's gospel. Again, the other gospels give beautiful additional touches. We'll bring in some of them. In Mark's gospel, chapter 9. In verse 9, the disciples are coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and um, I'll read from verse 9, but not comment too much on the beginning part. As they came down from the mountain, 
He charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. They kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias must first come? And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things, and how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be said at naught. In this next one, I want to bring in two things. One, the loved one's need, and some of the hindrances for us really seeing the Lord in our circumstances. So the first of the hindrances is here, and think of maybe the bigger of them. It came down, the Lord spoke about a, when the Son of Man is raised from the dead. They'd just seen him glorified on the mountain. They knew he was going to reign. They believed in him as the Messiah. They had done miracles. They'd already gone throughout the villages. They'd healed. They'd cast out demons. I take it that particularly the, what we've read about so far was Peter, James, and John coming down from the mountain with the Lord. And he says something that they don't understand. So they have the confidence to ask him a question. They get a good answer. It's about Elias. And very briefly, you can trace it out for yourself. I think if you take the notes that I have, you'll get the, um, you'll get the references there. But Elias was coming, and that was in spirit John the Baptist. John the Baptist spoke of himself as, uh, quoting from Isaiah, that he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And the Lord says, I believe it's in Matthew 11, that if you would receive him, this is that Elias. I can't quote it properly. You'll have to look it up. So he says, if you'll receive him, if your heart turns in repentance toward this coming one, He's come. It's John the Baptist. But the scribes and Pharisees were making it hard on the disciples. They were saying, where's Elias? I don't see him. They were making scriptural difficulties. And so the, the disciples raise it, and the Lord gives them a quick answer here, just as I've given you a quick answer. The other Elias is in Malachi, I believe. I think it's the third chapter where he's still coming and in the future. There was a past and a future, and they couldn't reconcile them. But there was another past and a future, two pop points in their dot verse, and they couldn't get them together in one person. And that was this business of suffering. So the Lord turns them to that. And I would suggest one of the first, one, one reason, why we don't discern the Lord's power and his love in our life or in the life of others is because we're trying to do what the disciples were doing. We're trying to steer a path that kind of takes the detour bypass around suffering. Satan offered it to the Lord in the wilderness. In the wilderness, he said, you could have all these kingdoms and the glory of them, if you would just bow down to him. If he would just skip the cross, he could have all of it now. That's always been his lie. And it's something I'll just suggest to you, you can meditate on for yourself, on it for yourself. It's something that gets in our way of seeing the Lord at work. So let's go on. And let's go to verse 14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him. I think that means not that he had 
great wounds, but if you look at the word, it means he was convulsed, as in like in a spasm. And so the word includes that thought, and I believe that's what it is. He teareth him, or he convulses him. And he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. You feel what it is for this father? You've got somebody you love. There are many of you in this room tonight and listening who have somebody that you love. And perhaps you have that personal relationship with the Lord. And they don't. Maybe they know the Lord is their Savior, but they're not heading toward Christ. Maybe they don't even know the Lord as their Savior. And you're passionate about them. You care about them. You love them. And in fact, it says in verse 17, the man speaking, I have brought unto thee my son. And then he goes on in the next verse and says, and I talk to your disciples. It's almost as though he were coming looking for the Lord, but the Lord and Peter, James, and John were up on the mountain. And he finds the nine disciples that were there, and he brings them, well, I'll take what I can get. His heart was headed for the right person. He finds the disciples, and what does he get? Verse, 13, uh, verse 19. He answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall, he, shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. There's a lot of parents here, or maybe it's a brother or sister that you long for, or maybe it's your grandpa or whoever it is, and you've prayed for them. You haven't seen that change. The Lord says, bring him unto me. And you say, but I've done that. I've done that. I've been praying for five years, or 10, or 15. Bring him unto me. Now watch what happens. And they brought him unto him, and we saw him straightway the spirit tear him. So he convulsed again, and he fell on the ground, and wallowed, foaming. Can you imagine your child, some of you are sitting here with small children. Your child this moment, on the floor in front of you, or your niece or your nephew. And they're foaming at the mouth. And they're in pain. And from the other Gospels, we find that this has been happening and they've been throwing themselves in the water and into the fire. Can you imagine what it would be? In fact, in the other Gospels, you'll see it. The Father says, uses the word us at one point in the conversation. Can you imagine, I assume he's referring to he and the mother. Can you imagine he and the mother? And there's this child. You've got you've to watch your children here with water or whatever, and you pay close attention. And if they're standing on top of the picnic table, you keep a little extra eye to make sure that there's somebody close enough to catch them if they totter close to the edge. Or if your husband doesn't do it and you notice it, you let him know that maybe it was a good thing he should have been doing. Can you imagine having to watch your child because someone that you had no power of was constantly trying to drown him or burn him to death? doesn't even compute in my head and that's what this father and this mother had been going through and they bring them to the lord they bring him to me to bring him to him and the problem solved instantly like that woman coming from behind no it got worse the lord doesn't always answer on our timetable but his heart of love and his power are never divided he could have if it had been for the good of that father and that mother and those people standing nearby watching, he could have healed that child instantly. Instead, he allowed that child to be on the ground, convulsed and foaming. And even there, it says, how long is it ago since this came on upon to him? And he said of a child, and oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire, there it is, and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. He's got a shred of hope. 
that there's power here. If you can do anything, show a little heart of love. If you can do anything, show a little heart of love to my child. I can't imagine. I'm not condemning this father. If I had a child that had been going through that, I don't know how thin my faith would have been. But what does the Lord say to him? He says to him, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Still hasn't healed the child. He's turned it back toward the father, but now he's brought it to the heart of the matter. Have you brought that child to me to handle for you? Are you willing to just commit it to me? Not commit it to me, take it back, commit it to me, take it back, commit it to me. What can I do to make the child better? Commit it to me. And the father says, and you can feel it. Straight where the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. He didn't want, he knew his faith wasn't what it should be. But he says, Lord, I believe. And that moment it's come from his lips. It says, when Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto them, unto him, thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. Spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. It was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead, but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. I don't know all the reasons the Lord had him wait. I don't know every reason why he had to pause and watch his son get torn and then torn again, even after he brought him to the Lord. There are a few. You realize how many billions of times the story has been printed? When missionaries translate into a new language, it's frequent. I'm sure it's not all the time, but it's frequent that Mark is one of the first books, the beginning parts of Genesis, and Mark is the shortest of the Gospels. And it gives, apparently, it's relatively easier than some anyway, to translate. And so it's been translated, it's been, uh, I should say, printed and shared billions of times. Did the father care about it at that moment? He didn't know a single thing about a printing press. He didn't know a single thing about the internet. He didn't know a single thing about you. He loved that child and he brought him to the Lord. And how much blessing has the Lord brought from that moment? How many people have been encouraged and used that expression? Lord, I believe, help now mine unbelief. I don't want me to be standing in the way of the good of that child. And if you're a father or a mother, you've brought your child to the Lord, and they're not where they should be. Just be willing to say, Lord, don't let me be in the way. If there's something I need to judge in my life that's hindering my child, let me judge it. If I need to confess that it's always been this way with the child, and that I'm part of the problem, let it be that way. But bring him to me. And the Lord in his power and his love will work far beyond our imagination, not on our time frame, not on our scale, not instantly removing the pain, not allowing us to steer past the suffering. But he will work according to his power and his love. Now, there's several things after this, and I'll just give three of them quickly without reading the verses. They asked the Lord, why couldn't we cast them out? They had been around casting out demons. These disciples, they had been. They'd cast out demons already. They'd been there and they'd done that. But the Lord tells them they had to act in dependence. And they may need to, for a time, be cut off even from natural joys to focus in on bringing him to me, if I can put it that way. And if there's that problem, you can't solve it. But the Lord may tell you, to depend on him, to bring it to him, to set aside from those natural joys for a time, the fasting, to focus in 
on the matter. There was one other issue that came up after. I'll just mention it. You can look into it. And it was pride. Look what comes after. The disciples were busy trying to figure out who was going to be first. And the Lord had more lessons to teach them. One thing that gets in the way when we have a loved one that we care for is pride. So we need to be dependent. We need to let the Lord act on his own time frame. There may be a time of fasting, setting aside from natural joys. But there also has to be the willingness to be humbled if that's what's needed. Let's turn last of all to John Gospel, chapter 6. Again, in your outline, I called this um, compassion for others, for the need of others. There's compassion for the need of others. We'll just go through a few highlights here of this story. It's the feeding of the 5,000, and most of you know it's the only miracle. It's, I believe it's the only miracle that's in all four of the Gospels, and it's beautiful. I'm going to give you a little something, a, a treasure to hunt for. It's a treasure hunt, I guess. Um, who passed out the fish? Who passed out the fish? And why is it in the gospel that it's in? Look for it. I'm going to give you another treasure. It's in this gospel. It's in John's gospel. It says in John's gospel that there was much grass. Why is it in John's gospel that it says there was much grass? It's treasure. It's beautiful. It's well worth pausing and chewing on. And when you are, you'll come across a bunch more. And if I gave you the answers here and you had a fact to check off, you'd lose all that bunch more. So those are the two things for you to look for. Who passed out the fish? In John's Gospel, you might get confused. You'll have to read that particular verse in, in um, Mr. Darby's translation, and perhaps we'll have time for it. But who passed out the fish, and why is there much grass in this Gospel? John 6, verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover feast of the Jews was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? I think this is beautiful. You look at the other Gospels, and historically it looks like the disciples came to the Lord. Look at the, the sounds from the other Gospels like they raised the issue. But this is the divine Son of God. And the divine Son of God knew everything, the end from the beginning. And he's the one that looks out. Why did those disciples come to him in the first place? I'll suggest to you that the divine Son of God was at work. And he's at work in a package deal here. He's working in the crowd. He's working in the disciples. He's working in you and I tonight. When he works things out, he works them out in a way that we could never untangle on our own. But he also works with individuals. You'll notice in the Gospel of John, that's much more, yes, it's different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You get stories in John that you don't have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's not following along the same line. But you also notice something. You get people named in the Gospel of John. You know, there's another thread that likes to say, thread of thought, that likes to say, God has power. But he doesn't love me. God has power, but he doesn't love me. You know, the Gospel that presents the divine Son of God, the one with ultimate power. It's the one that deals most with individuals. Where do you learn that it was Peter that picked up the sword? The other Gospels don't tell you, but John does. Where do you learn in the feeding of the 5,000 that Philip and Andrew had special roles? You don't find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You find it in John. And that's important because it means, it says, that the divine Son of God is interested in you 
the individual. We think in a crowd like this, this message is for somebody else. This message is for someone who this, that, and the other. No, the divine son of God looks on a crowd of 5,000 and he calls Philip with a lesson for Philip. And if we get a chance, we'll see other lessons for others. You know, Philip, Philip brought the message of the Messiah to Nathaniel in chapter 1. Philip brought that message. Philip recognized the Lord Jesus, that person. And he said, I want to bring Nathaniel to him. The Messiah, let's read the verse. I think it's on your sheet. It's in Psalm 132. Uh, it's Psalm 132 and verse 15. It says, speaking, you take the whole chapter, the Lord has chosen Zion, verse 13, and so on. Verse 15, I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Now the rabbis knew and had taught properly that this was the Messiah. The coming Messiah would feed her people with bread. Philip knew that the Lord Jesus was the Messiah. He'd already told that to Nathaniel. So the Lord calls out of that crowd. He calls Philip and he comes and says, Philip, what are we going to do? Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Oh, Philip could say, but Lord, you're the Messiah. You satisfy your people with bread. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. It's the best he could do. 200 penny worth. You work six days a week like a Jew did. You have 50 weeks in a year. That's 300 days. 200 penny worth is two thirds of a year's wages. That's eight months worth of wages. Philip's pretty practical, pragmatic type. Scans the crowd, looks it over does some rapid mental math, and eight months' salary, and everybody's going to have a smidgen. Besides that, where are you going to get it? The disciples we know from the other Gospels, it said, send them in the villages to buy bread. Andrew, Andrew and Philip are from, both from Bethsaida, perhaps friends, before they came to know the Lord, he brings the, ch the lad with his five barley loaves and two small fishes. Brings them to the Lord. Barley. In Solomon's time, barley is what the horses ate. Talking about the Messiah here. Something that is far greater than Solomon's time. Solomon being a figure of the Messiah, the, the coming millennial reign. And here's five barley loaves, two small fishes carried by a little lad. Then bring it to the Lord. Oh, what's this among so many? Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. There it is. Why, John? So the men sat down in number, about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. I want to say to you, these things are real. We have a living Savior. He's a person that cares about you. Is ready to feed you. And I'm going to give you a very concrete example that spoke to my heart from this week. We're still Saturday. We're still in this week. On Tuesday, thinking about a certain brother that Jim Hyland, who many here know, knew, now with the Lord, used to ship all kinds of stuff to this brother. And um, I was thinking about him on Tuesday because we couldn't 
having some real difficulties with shipping at, at Bible Truth Publishers, where I work. And so I said to Renee at breakfast on Tuesday, meditating on some of these verses, you know, where we're at right now, it's like we have five loaves and two fishes. I said it to my dad, and he said, well, maybe three loaves. <laughs> but whatever we've got, let's bring it to the Lord. And in prayer we did on Tuesday morning. Went into my dad's office to talk about the shipping difficulties and so on. And this brother I've spoken to once in my life. Put that in context. Spoken to him once in my life. I stepped into my dad's office and we were talking over where to start with some of the shipping difficulties. And we decided we needed to start with this brother. I stepped out of his office. And within, this is literal, it's not figurative, I'm not exaggerating, inside of 60 seconds, I had someone run over and tap me on the shoulder and say, that brother's on the phone for you. And I found out that just the day before, I got my chronology wrong, this happened on Wednesday, just the day before on Tuesday, the Lord had opened up the door for him, had opened up the opportunity to bring the shipping through the day I'd been thinking about him. It was the day the Lord, the, the day the Lord brought him to my mind. It was the day the Lord was thinking about him. And the moment the words were out of my mouth, almost literally, the moment the words were out of my mouth, it was on the phone. Because the divine Son of God is people to feed. And he wants them to have his word. Bring him your five loaves and two fishes. Don't look at them and say, oh, that's nothing. Bring them to him. Because his power isn't limited by you or me or what we have or what our resources are. And his heart isn't either. You can turn to it. I want to read a hymn before we close. And I don't want to go beyond the end. So I'll just say, the disciples enter this scene with apparently no bread. They cross the sea on a little vacation. Mark's gospel shows it to us. They're going to go apart into a desert place and rest a while. They come there and they find the crowd. But the crowd ran around and got there first, so I assume they had a fairly slow sea voyage, kind of like my wife and I doing little back and forth through the weeds on a canoe this afternoon, just kind of enjoying being out on the water, a little more of a restful trip. I assume they had a restful trip. The Lord didn't tell them to have rest a while without giving them that rest. But they arrive, and they have work to do, and they're empty-handed. They didn't have food to give. The lad had a little. They exit, and they exit with 12 hand baskets. You know how much a hand basket can hold? It's a kind of, it's kind of like a mini backpack. You go out for a day hike, not one of these great big massive, I'm carrying my tent on my back, but you go out for a day hike, you've got this little mini backpack or one like mine on the floor there to carry a laptop computer, something like that, with a capacity of two gallons. Every one of those disciples arrived empty-handed. Every one of them exited with two gallons of food on their back. You're going to be exiting this place, many of you, tomorrow. And you're exiting, and you don't say, wow, that was a good meal, and not gather up the fragments. The Lord told them, gather up those fragments and take them with you. The divine Son of God who could make bread in an instant. The divine Son of God who could have turned stones into bread if he'd wanted to who can turn five barley loaves into enough to feed 5,000 so they're absolutely full, and then each disciple to walk away full, he tells them to gather it up. He gives to you in a place like this, and he gives to you richly to enjoy, but he does say to you, gather them up, take them with you, because it's food from him. I'm going to just read Quickly, the stands are there multiple beautiful hymns that go along with the theme on my heart tonight. I'm just going to read quickly to you number 326 and close in prayer. The 326, as debtors to mercy alone, of heavenly mercy we sing nor fear to draw near to the throne our person and offerings to bring. I'm going to go down to stanza two. The work 
which his goodness began. There's his heart of love. The arm of his strength will complete. There's his power. Let's lay hold of it by faith. Not let these things that hinder get in the way. Let's thank him. Dear Lord Jesus, we do ask that we would lay hold more of thy heart. Thy heart toward us, thy love to us. And we do ask, Lord, that each of us in the different difficulties and circumstances that we're in, we bring them to thee and be willing to wait. Thy time for the answer. We just ask it. In thy name, Lord Jesus. Amen.